So I often get asked how to diagnose insulin resistance or prediabetes. That's exactly what this video is about. We'll cover things like uh, the old style simple tests that most docs still use, hemoglobin A1C and um, fasting blood glucose. We'll talk about another old style study, the um, OGTT. We'll also talk about um, the OGTT is the oral glucose tolerance test. We'll talk about triglyceride over uh, HDL and uh, also talk about um, Kraft Insulin Survey. You know, this quote here, these tests are rigged to fail. That was a quote from John's, John Lorscheider's uh, primary care uh, doc when John came back and said, I took the uh, Kraft Insulin Survey, my blood sugar went up to 300, so I think that means I've got full-blown diabetes, right? The doc said those are rigged to fail. Now, <clears throat> I have to cover this one comment, and then we'll get into the details. Uh, this, by the way, is one bottle, one twenty-ounce bottle of uh, Coke. Uh, it's got it's sweetened with sucrose, glucose, and and high fructose corn syrup. How many um, carbohydrates? Seventy-eight, sixty-five of them sugars. Um, this is a Mickey D's meal, a Mickey D's value meal. 190 grams of carbohydrate. So what does that mean? What does that tell me? Well, back to the issue of rig to fail. The OGTT, which you see here, is 75 grams of glucose in a bottle. It's the one where you drink the, the glucose. And the Kraft Insulin Survey, which is clearly rigged to fail, is 100. So as you see, many people more than once a day are doing rig to fail glucose challenges. Now, <clears throat> we know these, um, a lot of people have this problem. CDC would say a third of adults, 84 million, 90% don't know about it. UCLA would say, well, in California, it's over half. Now, <clears throat> first study, oral, one and two hour oral glucose tolerance test. Um, just a quick comment regarding A1C. It appears to miss maybe up to 50%, and we'll talk about that again a little bit later. Here is my um, OGTT from March of 2019. That's when we did um, the Healthy Life Summit in Orlando the second time. I came out of the blocks looking pretty good at a fasting glucose of 86, and that's better than it has been in the past. I've lost a little bit more weight, decreased more fat, uh, but my one hour went up to 183. My two hour was 114. And even with the very generous or um, conservative, I'm not sure the right not adjective to use for this, the lab would say uh, 183 is impaired tolerance for that first hour. And the second hour, I got down to 114. The lab would say, that's okay because it needs to be less than two, uh, 126. Uh, but the reality is, no, it shouldn't. It should be less than 100 by that point. Now, here's another group that's put this out on the internet, the Latino Diabetes Association. They're looking at hemoglobin A1C. And talk about conservative. They're saying, look, you're normal up to six. Well, most groups wouldn't say that. Also, they're saying you're normal at a fasting glucose up to 135. Again, also, most groups wouldn't, do, wouldn't say that. For hemoglobin A1C, most groups would say 5.7 to 6.4. And you see that here. You see that in all three of these images. 5.7 to 6.4. Hemoglobin A1C is your most typical statement of you've got... Uh, insulin resistance, prediabetes. You're putting down plaque in your arteries. You're putting yourself at risk for retinal damage and heart attack and stroke and dementia. So again, back to the oral glucose tolerance test. There's some other ways of interpreting it. Fasting glucose um, uh, over 100 to, uh, is considered to be um, uh, insulin resistant over 126 is considered to be full-blown diabetes and you get a fasting glucose with that first test on the oral glucose tolerance test 
What you do is you go nothing by mouth for eight hours. Most people do nothing by mouth before they go to bed, go in and get a, a, um, a glucose, uh, fasting glucose in the morning, like eight o'clock. They take the 75 grams, uh, then an hour later, they test it again. And your goal is it should be below 125. Actually, it should always be below 120, but that's the one hour glucose. The two hour should also be below 20. If it's over uh, 200, again, full blown diabetes. Um, <clears throat> if it's over 150, at one hour, there's 13 times the risk of developing full-blown diabetes, even within our standard commu medical community, which doesn't look very hard for it. 13 times the risk of developing diabetes just over the next seven to eight years. A two-hour value of 120 to 139. Many people would say you lost a third of your beta cell function, a uh, two-hour number of at 180 to one. Uh, uh, 199 lost, uh, no, excuse me, lost down to a third. And these guys would say 15% of beta cell function remaining. So I'm going, throwing a lot of numbers out here quickly. The bottom line is if you go back up to my numbers, um, again, pretty good number, uh, for fasting. Then I went up to 183 where anybody would say insulin resistant. And then back down to 114, which would say, uh, yeah, I still have some insulin resistance. It's just confirmatory of that last number. Now, <clears throat> uh, let's go to a dental number. I've talked about dental numbers and dentists seeing insulin resistance and prediabetes and cardiovascular inflammation multiple times. Now, they did a study where they looked at uh, basically dental parameters. In other words, a quarter of people had five millimeter pocket depths or more, or more up to a fourth or more had five millimeter pocket depths, or four missing teeth, plus a hemoglobin A1C greater than or equal to 5.7, 90%, uh, 92% accurate in defining or identifying significant insulin resistance. Well, you know, that's not that difficult because most of us would use the 5.7% for hemoglobin anyway. How about the Kraft diabetes profile? It was developed by Dr. Robert Kraft. It's a timed test using uh, insulin response to a measured glucose challenge. It's 100 grams of glucose instead of 75. As I mentioned, um, the OGTT is 75. So... Again, a lot of docs would say that's way too much. You're going to have huge glucose swings. <clears throat> well, remember what we said. A value meal is 190 grams of glucose. So they measure that over a four-hour period, the same way that they do with OGTT. But they also get insulin response as well. So <clears throat> that's why we look at, uh, if I suspect insulin resistance on somebody, even with a OGTT. In the past, I've often gone to full-blown craft uh, diabetes profile. That's what we did with John, and he described his uh, experiences there and what we found. Uh, not so impressive OGTT, but then a significant craft number. If you have questions or, in, or interest about the craft survey, we've got several videos out there about it. It was done by Joseph Kraft. He was a lab director, pathologist in a large Chicago lab um, a couple of decades ago. He wrote this book. It's kind of a folksy book, Diabetes Epidemic and You. Uh, should everyone be treated or tested? And absolutely not. Only those concerned about their future. What's interesting about his, about his book is it shows age 51 to 60, for example, and then it shows that over half the people that they tested had a positive uh, Kraft insulin survey. Now there were some um, there were some mitigating circumstances. Most of these people had already been uh, referred by their docs for evaluation for diabetes, so something was already going on with these folks. But again, as you see, 
If you want to call these tests rigged to fail, as many docs do, then you got to realize that the standard American diet is rigged to fail multiple times every day. Back to the insulin uh, prediabetes foot profile. Uh, after doing several thousand of these, uh, Joe Kraft and his team basically showed four different patterns of insulin and glucose response. Here's what they were. A normal pattern where your blood um, glucose would start at 80, go up to just over 120, and then back down. Insulin would start at less than 5 or 10, go up to 60 to 80, and then again come back down. But then you started getting problems with it taking an hour. You know, the first one was you got a good insulin uh, uh, reaction within, an, within half an hour. In the second pattern, pattern two, it took an hour. Pattern 3A, it took two hours. Pattern 3B, it took three hours to see that insulin finally peak. In other words, what's going on is that storage phase, that first phase of insulin release, is just not happening. You're sort of wearing your pancreas out at that point. Then you've got pattern four, where you've got hyperinsulinemia, where you're, uh, you're not really controlling your blood sugar. It's going up to like 250, which again is full-blown uh, diabetes. But even to, to get it back down from there, your pancreas has to be producing insulin levels up to like 100, 150, 200, even 250 and peaking at two hours and coming down. Then you have pattern five, which is what they call insulinopenic. Insulinopenia meaning not very much. Um, and these people don't have much insulin to, to put out there. It stays below 50 during the entire process. We've talked about other ways of getting a good clue about, um, about uh, insulin resistance. Uh, that's the triglyceride to HDL ratio. And as you see, you know, triglyceride to HDL ratio in Caucasians, 3.5 or more is considered very, very strong evidence. For people of color, it's even lower values, 3.0 and, and below, or 2.5 for Mexican Americans and African Americans. Um, again, you look at mine in March of 2019. I had really good numbers here. And it's because I've classically had very low triglycerides. Um, bottom line, like we've said before, are these tests rigged to fail? No, no more so than the standard American diet. Um, and why are these important? We've covered that in other videos. But this video, again, was set up basically to just take a quick run through the different ways that you can find out if you have insulin resistance. If you've made it this far, thank you again for your interest. Thanks, and if you hit that uh, subscribe or like button, it makes a big difference. Um, an even bigger difference happens when you share. You can share on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Pinterest. When you do that, it makes a big difference in terms of the algorithm. It sends, um, this to other people realizing that humans think this is interesting information and helpful. Um, thank you again.